Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast with Rob Lewis and Austin Price. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this Mailbag Edition. Plenty to get to, but this edition of the podcast, as always, is brought to you by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. You can check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. And don't forget that Blue Water has partnered with Marshall Cleaning Services to offer duct cleaning services for you. They use state-of-the-art equipment to clean and clear your ductwork, whether you live in an older home, a renovated home, or even a new home. Regular air duct cleaning is a good decision. It's easy, convenient, and affordable to clean out your air ducts. Our service not only improves the air in your home, but will also improve the efficiency of your unit. It's using an advanced system and it removes all the dust in your vents without making a mess in the process. Helps alleviate allergies, sinuses, asthma, bronchitis, nasal congestion, plenty of things, eye irritation, all those things that dust uh, bothers you with. So be sure and check out that service that Blue Water Climate Control offers. Of course, you can always give them a call at 865 or check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com to see all of their services, book an appointment online, and check out their specials and financing as well. Plenty to get to, as I mentioned, lots of questions. Guys, we'll dive right into those, and we'll start with this one out of the gate here. Who from the offensive staff, football-wise, is in the office, and what are some of the things that they have been doing? Austin, what do you got? Three coaches in the office right now on offense? Uh, It would be four. Uh, Golish, Halsley, Cody Burns, and Glenn Ellerby. So and everybody, everybody's everybody running back, right? Everybody right. but the running backs coach. That's right. Um, so you know, what have they been doing? A little bit of recruiting. Some guys have not been able to do recruiting yet. Um, and then, uh, you know, just kind of, I think, you know, working on current team stuff, watching film to see what exactly they, who, who all they have on the roster. Yeah, lots of evaluation of the current staff, certainly some film evaluation of recruits as well. And again, uh, with a spot to fill with that uh, running back position as well. So that's something to keep an eye on uh, in the coming days as hopefully um, Josh Heupel gets this staff assembled. All right, let's go to C.D. Vall, who's up next. Do you buy into the notion that Danny White is basically telling these potential coordinators who their assistants will be rather than let them picking their own assistant that seems to be a really good way to scare off potential coordinators. I don't believe that that's the case. I think Josh Heupel has some defensive guys in mind that he would like to have, um, you know, potentially to go with a coordinator. Um, some coordinators, it's a big deal that you, you know, to get to hire your own staff, Rob, and for others, it's not a big deal, particularly if you're an NFL guy, you know, those guys get paired up. I mean, owners and GMs pair them up with coaches all, all the time that way. So, um, I don't, I don't think Danny White's demanding that, you know, these guys or this guy is, has to be there. Um, but it will not surprise me if there's a defensive assistant on board working at Tennessee, even before a coordinator is hired. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's really weird about whether things drug on and, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to know how much he's meddling, but I do know that you know, he kind of went out of his way to say, you know, in, in Heupel's introductory press conference that, that he would not meddle. Now, whether or not that was just, you know, public posturing, I don't know. But um, he also I said can, Josh Heupel was I, the only person he offered the job to. Yeah. So, like I say, I don't know that – I don't know that it's the point where he's sitting in on interviews or that kind of thing. But I would I would imagine he's probably, you know, given, given Heupel some parameters or, you know, some pre- prerequisites that he's looking for in, in assistant coaches. I personally – I mean, I, if I'm a coordinator, I want to hire my own guys. I mean, that'd be a pretty big deal to me. Well, I think – And I think that's why you've not seen anybody, you know, get here on the defensive side of the ball, Brent, because while I think Josh Heupel, as you said, has some guy in, has some guys in mind, I think if he hired the right guy and that person said, hey, listen, I, I like Coach X too, but I really want my guy who is Coach Y, I, I think that, that, that Coach Heupel is going to, you know, you know, at least be willing to listen to that. But, again, I do think you're right. I think he has some guys in mind. And, and we'll see if, if any of those guys show up before he names a coordinator. Let's go to UT Sportsman 16. Is the inability to make a D.C. hire a red flag for Heupel, or is it more an indictment of where Tennessee is as a football program with the investigation, been bad for over a decade, et cetera, et cetera? Rob, I'll start with you on this one. You see as a, a major red flag, is it more about where Tennessee's at, or is it more about Josh Heupel can't get somebody hired? Uh, to me, it – it feels like it's more about where Tennessee's at, you know, uncertainty of, 
the NCAA sanctions, the uncertainty of, you know, your roster to, to a degree with a transfer portal. And, you know, just maybe how hard of a job this looks like from the outside in. Austin? I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, the around, around college football, coaches talk, coaches, you know, see, you know, kind of where this thing's at currently. And, uh, you know, I think your, your top end guys at your best places, you know, like an Al Washington, is he a top end coordinator? No, because, you know, he's never called a defense. Is he a, is a, a top shelf coach? I do think that. I think he's a really good developer. I think he's an excellent recruiter. You know, but I think at the end of the day, he was willing to take less money to stay at Ohio State where things are a little more stable. And let's face it, when you're at those programs, unless you're Clemson, there's always turnover among coordinators. And so don't you think he's in line to become the new D.C. at Ohio State if uh, if they lose theirs? I, I do, and, and I think that's a big reason why he's, he'd rather stay there. You know, hey, let's give this a couple of years and, and see where we're at. Two years from now, he may be the D.C. there, and, you know, it's a moot point. Yeah, look I at the, go ahead, Rob. I was just say, look at the track record. Another point in Ohio State's favor there, look at the track record of, of coordinators – in that program I and mean, moving on to become head coaches. It's a, that's, that's the kind yeah. of job where you can make that jump. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I, I think the, I think two things for me, one, I do think the NCAA stuff is a, is a concern, particularly for a young guy who's on an upward trajectory, a little fear of, Hey, I get to Tennessee and maybe I get lost because there's going to be some struggles there. If it doesn't work out for me, how much does that set me back in my, my course or my path to be, a head coach, you know, and that type of thing. So I think for a younger coach, that's a little bit more of a factor there. I think the other thing too is, you know, th this job, I mean, Josh Heupel wasn't even thought of as, as a candidate for this job until uh, basically, you know, hours before he was announced. So I, I don't think it's a situation where he had a, a bunch of defensive guys lined up. Obviously, Robbie knew he was going to bring his offensive staff with him. That's why they all got here essentially 48 hours later. But he didn't have a – I don't think he had a clear defensive plan in mind because I don't think he envisioned himself getting this job. And, and so I think as a result of that, that's been a little bit of a, a slowdown too that they've, you know, been looking around for some guys because I don't think he said, hey, if I – my next job I'm bringing these three or four defensive coaches with me, whereas he knew he was bringing his offensive coaches with him wherever he got another job because – that was, you know, that that's the group he's kind of married himself to with his offensive plan. Um, yeah. go, go ahead. I'm mean, I just saying I agree. I mean, you made the point last week, I and mean, because of the nature of the search, it wasn't like, you know, he had been talking to search firms and, you know, getting advice from search firms to, hey, get, you know, start making a list and, you know, the, of what you're going to present in your interview. All right, let's go to a hoops question here of the current basketball team who is likely to return could we realistically be replacing four starters with the only holdover being Vescovi, Rob? Yeah, I think that's realistic. I mean, just I mean, saw Jaden Springer blow up for, for 30 points tonight after he went for 22 on, on Saturday. And, uh, you know, you, you know where I stand on Keon Johnson. I mean, I, he, he's not in the, lottery, in the top 10 in all these mock drafts by accident. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, the question is, does anybody come back? Does a, you know, does a senior come back? I mean, Pond's not going to come back, um, you know. I've had people inside the program tell me they think that Fulkerson's going to come back. And I think that's a decision. That's, I mean, he's certainly not going to leave and get drafted. Right. But, I mean, is he going to go, you know, make some money in, in Europe? What is, you know, what does he want to do? I don't know right now. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that one moving forward. But I tell you what, you, uh, you should enjoy watching Keon Johnson and Jaden Springer play because – um, everybody in the country's taken notice of what those two guys have done and, and what I think everybody expects them to do down, down the stretch of this season and, and what they're going to do offensively uh, and defensively as well. But certainly the way this offense is kind of morphing into them um, being the showcase of, of this offense, the way we saw it against Georgia and certainly the way we saw it against Kentucky as well. Uh, have you ever seen a head coach have so much trouble filling out a staff before? Huge red flag that he's in over his head or more of a blimp on the radar. We, we've kind of touched on this a little bit. I just I referenced this question back because um, in terms of having a hard time filling out a staff, it, it took Derek Dooley a while to find and hire Justin Wilcox. Um, that was kind of the last piece of his hire. He had actually hired, I guess, Lance Thompson um, and 
I, I want to say somebody else uh, on the defensive side of the ball. And, and Justin was kind of the last piece. Um, it, and maybe, maybe Lance was just the one. I, I remember Lance went on the interview with, with Dooley um, and, and then David Blackburn to, to go interview Justin Wilcox. So that one was one that took a while to get. Everybody kind of wondered where he was going to go for a defensive coordinator. And it took a while for, for that hire to be made. So, um, you know, that's kind of one that jumps out. And obviously, Austin, it took Jeremy Pruitt a while to get an offensive coordinator hired when he hired Jim Chaney. It did. Um, the difference being is, is, you know, especially with, with, with JP, that was after year one. So you had the rest of your staff here. Agreed. You know, yep. this, this is, you know, a bit bizarre from a standpoint of, you know, they've not announced anybody. I mean, think about it. Heupel's been on the job two weeks. Cody Burns was, you know, has been here one full week, um, you know, in the building. Halsley and 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 Gullish have been in here two weeks, uh, you know, and finally, you know, Ellerby got here um, after his uh, vacation at home, um, you know, last Saturday. But I mean, like, it, it is a bit bizarre. Like most of the time, eighty percent of your staff is on scene within forty-eight hours of being hired. And then there might be a straggler or two that take a while because you don't know what you want out of that position coach or, you know, that you may be navigating around a contract or something like that uh, with, 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 a, with a coach that you're trying to bring in. This is just a bit bizarre. I, you know, it is what it is. They're going to wait at this point. Um, but, you know, I do think that it's killing them with some recruiting that they're not able to do. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, these 22s are a lot closer to decisions than – you know, um, than, than anybody would like if you're Tennessee. And so it, to me, it's Tennessee's going to probably have to, I think they're going to lose kids and they're going to have to hope that they can overachieve this fall and win them back in the fall. That, that you know, not, not everybody, but some. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting kind of a marketing PR move um, to, to hold and, and not announce some guys. Uh, to, to get some positive vibes going on out there and get some positive publicity. As, as a result of that, Rob, the narrative is it's about who they can't hire or who they haven't been able to hire as opposed to who uh, he has hired, whether it's in the recruiting office, the strength staff, or, or with his assistant coaches as well. I mean, they, they've had some opportunities to put a narrative out there with some more good news as opposed to the narrative being what they haven't been able to get done uh, which, again, I, I think is an, an interesting move. I don't think that's the sports information move necessarily, but that's an interesting move out of, out of the football camp and out of Danny White's camp. Yeah, so. I mean, it, it started with the with the head coaching search. I mean, that, that's kind of been, you know, since Jeremy Pruitt was let go, kind of who they've not been able to get has been the bigger headline and who they have been able to get. All right, back to basketball we go. With Josiah Jordan James' ability to get to the boards and play that key role in a small lineup, is Tennessee a better team without Fulkerson on the floor if they want to push the ball? Would Barnes ever consider Fulkerson off the bench as a sixth man uh, with points energy type guy? I don't think so, man. They had – Fulky was on the floor tonight and they had 16 fast break points, was most the most they've had this season. So, I don't I don't think that's an argument. I mean, I think you can play fast and Fulky can run the floor. And I don't, I don't think having him out there is detrimental to getting up and going. Now, I think, you know, not having – both he and Pons on the floor together and give, giving yourself that extra ball hand or that can push it. I think that, you know, makes it easier to run, makes Tennessee more effective. Yeah. I mean, Fulker, Fulkerson's not John Conkac or Will Purdue. I mean, like, you know, it, he moves well. I mean, I mean I, what, that, to me, that notion's kind of silly. And he had two buckets tonight, and one of them was he, you know, he beat everybody down the floor and Keon found him on that little alley-oop in the first few minutes of the game. So I don't, I don't think that's an issue at all. Yeah, well, to, look, we said this a couple of weeks ago. To be able to run and play up tempo, you got to win on the glass and you got to find the outlets, you know, and you got to turn and go. And that's what they did tonight. I mean, they got the ball off the rim and, and they ripped and ran with it. And if it was a folk, if it was Fulkerson with the rebound, he quickly got the outlet. If it was Keon Johnson or Josiah or somebody else, it was put your head down and go um, and beat everybody down the floor with the basketball. So, but to do that, the other team's got to miss some shots and you got to win the, you got to win the rebounding edge. Uh, which Tennessee certainly did early in that first half and got them going and got them playing fast. All right, back to a little football here. Where is this D.C. search now that Washington is a no? And also, what does a running back coaching spot look like? AP, you had the note um, that 
Tennessee's at least had a conversation of some kind with Casey Rogers, former Tennessee Vol, who's uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at this point in time. We don't know where they'll go from there or if anything will go from there, but that's at least a new name that, that Tennessee has spoken with since the Washington news, right? It is. Um, you know, I, I, if you were asking me to kind of lean one way or the other, I, I would lean that Tennessee would probably go pretty hard after Casey Rogers. You know, I mean, I, I think that he's got a solid uh, resume. Um, you know, he did play here. Obviously that helps. Um, you know, but he, he's also been around some really good defensive minds and kind of, you know, checks off a lot of boxes that they're looking for. So, you know, um, you know, we'll see if they can get something done financially. You know, what what are they willing to pay versus what he makes as the defensive line coach for Tampa? You know, they make a lot of money in the NFL. So, you know, being – They don't have to recruit. That's right. And you don't have to recruit. So, we'll see. And he's been such a, a lifer in the NFL. I mean, he coached some college ball early in his career, but – once he made that move, there was not kind of a back and forth um, between the league and, and college. He's been a league guy this whole time. So, you know, be interested to see how they, the, you know, how they approach this and if they can get him to the finish line. Yeah, family ties to Knoxville, which may or may not be a factor to, to help you there. Obviously, family ties throughout the state of Tennessee as well. Does he feel like he can have an opportunity to be a play caller again in the National Football League? Um, or is his better path to being a play caller, you know, in the college game? I don't think – he would consider a college job, and I don't know that he wants this job. I think this is probably the only college job he would consider at this point because it is his alma mater and because he does have the family will, ties here, right? I, I will say this. I do think the office hours for Josh Heupel are going to be far different than the office hours that were for Jeremy Pruitt. So I do think it may be more of an NFL-type schedule that would potentially benefit uh, you know, trying to attract an NFL coach like Casey Rogers. And, and I think, again, I've said, I think, you know, Heupel's big on the, you know, morning practices. That's also something they do in the National Football League. And uh, I think that would be a benefit as well. Yep. Heupel has been, that's, that's important to note. He has been a morning practice guy. Um, it's kind of his deal. So we'll see if that happens. And, and I think that would be his choice and preference at Tennessee would be to, to have morning practices throughout the fall instead of the afternoon practices. As for the running back uh, position, you know, I, I haven't heard a ton of names out there with that. I mean, there, you know, is the guy at Louisiana Lafayette, you know, his name was early mentioned. I don't know. Jabar Jaluk. Yeah. I mean, Western Kentucky, that name sort of floated a little bit. Um, you know, could that be the Lachlan. guy? You know, could they go a veteran guy like um, – what was it, a Tony Ball that used to be at Georgia? I think he's at La Tech now. Would be, you know, would he be interested in getting back in the SEC? Um, the guy at Rice um, has, has Jerry Mack. Jerry Mack's got some Memphis ties. I just don't know that there's anything definitive with any of those guys, but those are some SEC guys, some, some Memphis tie type guys or Tennessee tie type guys. At least they recruited there or been around there. So, so we'll see where, where they elect to go with that one. Um, you know, whenever they, whenever they can get to the point of, of getting that one done. Um, all right. Continuing on here to a couple more questions. Um, how important is the recruiting office staff? Can the recruiting office make up for a staff that isn't made up of strong recruiters? Do you think, do strong recruiting coaches suffer if the back office isn't a strong unit? Um, I don't think a recruiting office can make up for a lack of strong recruiters because recruiting office can't go on the road recruiting. So I don't think they can make up for that. I do think the recruiting office, things. yeah, I think the recruiting office is extremely important from an organizational standpoint. And I think it's extremely important from an evaluation standpoint. When you look at, I mean, no, no offense to the assistant coaches out there um, through the years, Rob, but I mean, it wasn't an assistant coach that found, uh, Eric Ainge or Dante Stallworth, which Jerry Colquitt found in the recruiting office years ago, or Inky Johnson or Emmanuel Mosley or, or some of these guys like that. I mean, you, you have – I mean, coaches can't sit and pour through hours and hours of tape. I mean, you've got to have a gatekeeper on the front end who can cull those things down and get them to the position coaches to evaluate. So I think your recruiting office is important. I don't think they can overcome – position coaches who aren't very good recruiters because they can't go on the road and help them out that way. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I completely agree. Now, from an evaluation standpoint, if you get a guy that's 
you know, or several guys who are really good, it's a big help. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Scott Altizer, who, you know, found the, found a lot of kids back, back in the day. Um, and from that standpoint, you can make it, you can make the coach's job a lot easier on the front end, but no, you, I'm, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. You can't, you can't overcome, you know, if a guy's a poor recruiter, no matter who you got in the office. I do like this Austin from the, from his recruiting office setup that he's got piece that he's got to get that Hypo's got assembled right now. And it's not completely done. There, there are, there is that it is a recruiting office that has Tennessee knowledge. Okay. Your on campus recruiting coordinator um, has been here before, understands recruiting to Tennessee. Brandon Lawson understands recruiting to Tennessee. Trey Johnson understands finding players for Tennessee and, and, and what you got to do to recruit to Tennessee. I do like the fact that he has brought in some Tennessee awareness in that recruiting office out of the gate because I think that can help them. I think too many times coaching staffs have come in here and said, well, this is how we did it at the other place and, and we're going to go into States and we're going to go here and maybe they're just not realistic. Right. I mean, you, you know, uh, it's just not realistic that you're going to go into that state and beat out the home state school for a bunch of kids that way. So I do like the fact that there's some Tennessee awareness uh, in his recruiting office to this point. You think that's fair? I think it's fair. I think the biggest thing too is just, hiring people that understand the relationships that you have to manage out there, being able to read the room, you know, um, I think that's as important as anything. And, and so that the awareness that you're talking about allows Tennessee to understand what high school coaches, you know, to, uh, you know, work through or, or, or lean on, um, you know, and, and then be able to read, you know, be able to read the room and, you know, see, okay, this is, you know, this is how this should play. It's how it's played in the past. And, uh, and kind of go from there. Quick question here. D'Angelo Gibbs is going to be a part of this team this season. I'm saying no. Austin? No, I don't think he's even here anymore. Yep, I don't think he's a part of that at all. Back to hoops. His, 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 his last, his last uh, hurrah was a uh, fight between him and Jameer John, which was, I think, in November, the complex, broken up by lots of players. Back to hoops we go. One minute left in regulation. Tie game, no timeouts. What five do you have on the floor, Rob? This person says he thinks that Viscovi is a liability on the defensive end. Fulkerson's confidence uh, make it difficult to play those guys in crunch time right now. Oh, I would have Keon, Jaden, Pons, Josiah, and Viscovi for free throw shooting purposes. I don't think – I mean, I think Muscovy's a better defender than Victor Bailey, despite nope, the, no Fulkerson. Just, I mean, it, I would for defense purposes, yeah, it would depend on the matchup. I mean, if you if you're playing somebody with a lot of size, I might think differently. But um, and I because I, I don't think Bailey is a better defender than Viscovi, despite a monumental difference in athletic ability. He's still, and I would put Viscovi out there for free throw shooting purposes. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see how they manage Viscovi ball handling wise against teams that press. Do they do they take a little bit of that away from him? Do they do they use him in a different way in the press? T Tennessee was better in the press against Georgia when the ball was out of his hands because it was advanced. You know, they advanced the ball passing. You know, with with some of those other guys. You know, better than than Viscovi. You know, head down dribbling it that way. But I'm with you. He's got to be on the floor for for free throw shooting purposes because you want him to get fouled if you have uh, if you have the lead. I, I think two things that jump out at me. One, where do you think Fulkerson's confidence is offensively right now? And two, we talked about this a little bit in the post game, uh, fast break after the Georgia game. If you've got to have a bucket, are you just isolating? Uh, you, you mentioned this. Are you just isolating on one side of the floor with Keon and Springer? Yes, that's what I'm doing without question. I mean, both of those guys can – I mean, they're, they're the best at, at getting by their man into the lane to, to create a shot for themselves. Keon is not going to get his that little turnaround block by, by anybody. Both of them can get to the rim. Um, so, yeah, I'm putting – like, I'm posting one of them up and putting one of them on the wing and maybe, you know, ball screen and roll or, or something. But those two – those are the two guys that are involved, without right. question. And all, and all this Covey, I, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but there's – I mean, I, I love Santiago. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he shouldn't play. But I, I don't get playing him more minutes than, than Keon. And I know Keon was in a little foul trouble tonight, but it wasn't anything severe. 
and uh, Viscovi played 35 minutes and Keon played 27. That that would never happen <laughs> if I was delegating the minutes. Fulkerson's confidence is is that a, is that a thing or no? I don't, I mean I don't think he's a very confident offensive player, and I think he's relieved that they're kind of shifting and you know not running everything through him every time that he doesn't feel like he's got to make a play every time in the half court. I mean, I, I mean, he had eight rebounds and, and four assists, both team highs tonight. So it's not like he didn't contribute. And I think he's far better suited to, to be in option B or C mentally and, and ability wise. Onward. We go with the mailbag questions here is Tony Vitello comfortably assured of support from Danny white on facility upgrades that he needs to compete this decade with the other SEC programs. I don't know that Danny White's had any kind of sit down conversation with Tony Vitello. I, I don't know that they've spent a whole lot of time. I'll say this. If you want to keep Tony Vitello on, on your staff at Tennessee, somebody better commit to some, to some facility upgrades because if he continues to build this program and has success, somebody's going to come after him. And yeah, they are. he's been assured and promised that he was going to get facility upgrades and he hasn't seen anything other than, a fresh coat of paint and some new pictures hanging on the wall, basically. So uh, they're going to have to get some stuff done for him if they're going to if they're going to keep him. If that's going to be a priority, and they've got some limitations with that stadium and what they can and can't do, but they're going to have to do they're going to have to do something for it because they are definitely behind in the arms race there, and that will affect um, coaching interest in this job because how successful can you be with some of those limitations? Uh, to Antioch Vol, we go. Has the manner in which Jeremy Pruitt was let go made it more difficult to fill out this staff? Do you think the administration has any regrets with the way it was handled? I would think that in this industry, it doesn't really matter if they were right or wrong, but the perception uh, is with the rest of the coaching pool. And I'm not really sure, maybe you're saying from the drag out standpoint or the fact that they were as maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, as they were at the press conference about things in, in terms of this. You know, the number of violations, Austin, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking there. Maybe you can. I think he's just saying the fact that they, that instead of just, you know, firing the guy for going three and seven, they, you know, did the old investigation thing to get out of the buyout. I think that's what everybody's trying to you know, wrap their mind around. Um, I don't think they have any regret about it at all. I think if they had to do it over again, Don D. Plowman and Randy Boyd would do the exact same thing. Um, do I think that it's affected them in the, in the with the coaching search? 100%. I've talked to too many coaches that, you know, bring all that stuff up. You know, they're, they're, the common quote I get is, I can't believe they burned it all down just to save the buyout money. That's the perception out there. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's the perception amongst college coaches about Tennessee right now. From Bronco Ball, after Coach Heupel was hired, the name of Mason Smith, who works in recruiting office of Mississippi State, was mentioned as a possibility. Anything come of that? I've not heard that name, Austin. No, me neither. All right, onward. If you are Josh Heupel, why not offer Ty Simpson's dad a position on the staff? Yes, sure, it's risky, and yeah, Salter and Bailey won't like it, uh, and sure, he may or may not be good at coaching football, but our program's already in the toilet, so who cares at this point? The only way we're ever going to get out of this hole is if we can somehow stack a few really good classes together. That's just not going to happen anytime soon unless we can capitalize on the 22 class and get something started that way. Talk me off the ledge here. I just don't see this program being competitive at all for at least five years if we can't get the ball rolling with this 22 class. Jump. Just jump. Jump. Uh, no, I mean, in, in reality, like, I don't think Josh Heupel understood – that that was even an option with Jason Simpson when he got here, which is why Golish, tight ends coach, you know, Jeremy Pruitt was going to hire Jason as his quarterback's coach. And, and, you know, I always thought that was kind of like putting Jason Simpson in a no-win position if that, you know, if that had come to fruition, because how's he going to go into a, a recruit's home or actively recruit another quarterback and the quarterback and his parents look at Jason Simpson and take him seriously when his own kid would be in the room? You know, I just think that it's tough. So um, I always thought if Jason was going to be on staff, it should have been as a tight ends coach or a running backs coach or a receivers coach. Um, but I, I think that, you know, by the time that Heupel realized that that was even a possibility, it, he, he couldn't really go down that avenue anymore. Why hasn't someone hired Rodney Garner as sought after as he's been for so many years? Seems strange that he's still unemployed. Does he have an understanding that he will be on Tennessee staff? 
I think there's a certainly a possibility that he will can be could end up being on Tennessee's staff. Uh, that would not surprise me if that ends up happening. In terms of him not accepting a job, then have to got a contract at Auburn that they're going to pay him, uh, Rob, to to not work. He can be selective. He's got kids that are high school, going to be seniors in high school next year. Uh, he's never been a guy who's moved a whole lot. If you look at his coaching career, the guy's lived in Auburn. Knoxville, Tennessee, Athens, Georgia, and 30 years of coaching, which is pretty remarkable for a position coach only, that those are his three stops in the college coaching world. Yeah, but <clears throat> I agree with you. I mean, he's not – and I mean, he's not a guy that's going to – with the contract in hand, he's not – you know, he doesn't have to go, you know, to take a step down. I mean, you know, go coach at South Carolina or, or Vanderbilt or, or something of that nature where you're, you know, still in the league but on a – totally different level than, than you were at, at Auburn. So I'm not, I'm not surprised by that. I just think he can be selective. I mean, I just, I just think that's, that's the bottom line with there. All right. A couple more before we get out the door here. Uh, obviously hiring a defensive coordinator will have a lot to do with the answer here, but would Kevin Simon be a legitimate candidate at linebacker? I think he would like to be. Um, I don't know that he will get that opportunity. I think as he mentions, it just depends on who the, um, who the defensive coordinator is and, and what they what they might or might not do, want to do uh, when, it, when it's all said and done. So um, I don't know. Uh, again, he would like to be. I don't know that he would given the oppor- be given the opportunity to do that. Uh, Austin, we appreciate uh, you and everything that all the guys do. Keep up the great work. AP, if you're ever down, have, get some downtime or just want to get away for a bit, come over to Pinehurst and let's tee it up. Free golf or AP, it sounds like, or at least complimentary golf. Or at least Who's golf. This by? With, you didn't say their uh, name. No, this is by Army Dirt Dart. I can I can promise you, Army Dirt Dart, that, that you're going to be hearing from Austin Price. <laughs> 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 Lots of little gems over here. Hey, and, you and, know what I'm thinking of? This is legitimate. March 12th, March 12th, Cayman Marley plays a game on Friday night. I'm thinking we go over there, we hit the Thistle Do, we play Pinehurst number two with Army Dirt Dart. Sounds like a win, win, win trip to me. Might be spring practice going over here. We might maybe actually, Rob should cash could, in too. Could, could we actually get? Uh, Rob's got basketball to cover. Could we actually potentially be seeing a football practice on, on that time at Tennessee? Is I that don't know. I, I, as of right now, I think the spring game is slated for the seventeenth. But I think there's a chance that seventeenth of April. Seventeenth of April. Yes. Okay. Make sure you get. Um, um, do I do think that it could be pushed back a week to the 24th, though. I, I think there's going to be a lot of shuffling right there with the potential to open things back up for recruiting, you know, just, you know, just to see. All right. Now, Army Dirt Dart does have a question. Where's Ty Simpson going? Okay. <laughs> so you, you got to answer, answer that question before you have a chance to tee it up with him anywhere. Well, I, you know, uh, obviously I don't think the 19th lines up real well for Tennessee. He's continued to talk to Josh Heupel. He talks to Josh Heupel a lot, um, you know, but, uh, you know, Ty also I know is playing a lot of misdirection out there with a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of people that, that, that really feel like Alabama is, you know, a team to beat. Uh, I know he's got the crystal balls for Clemson. You know, if you were asking me to, to, to kind of peg it, I, I would lean if you – I would lean Alabama as the, as the favorite at this point. That's just my opinion. Maybe I'll be wrong, though. Last question here from Braves Balls. Do you envision, given the negative publicity of the program with looming NCAA sanctions, any way that this staff and AD try to open things up to the media like practice access, coaching access, should. or player access, kind of like Kiffin did when he was here or Bruce Pearl, to create some buzz and juice, at least for spring, if nothing else? A lot of these guys have little to no SEC ties. It just seems like an easy decision to me to try to start some momentum to sell your program. Um, I, I, I think that they would, and I think there's a possibility they would, Brent, but COVID's still around. So I don't think we're going to be going to spring practice. You know, I think that spring practice will get the videos and the pictures sent to us and we'll do Zooms and that's how it'll be done. I think I'm, I'm hopeful by August for fall camp, we'll be able to go start going again. And I would suggest I would I would think it would be beneficial to them for Juice Rob to get some publicity, to give some access, to to, yeah. to kind of get get a, get your narrative and get your story out there more than just a you know a, a Zoom call with everybody on there at one time. 
I 100% agree. I mean, I, I don't have anything to add other than wholehearted agreement. I mean, to, you know, create some, some goodwill, you know, with the media, with, with the fans, give some access, give some insight into what you're doing. I mean, to, to be as, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to pile on Jeremy Pruitt, but I mean, I think when you're, I think he, he was so restrictive with, you know, with a program that just had no, no positive juice around it. I mean, to not want to be proactive and, and generate some goodwill. I, I, I mean, that's not the reason he got fired, obviously, but I, I just thought that a misstep on his part and a missed opportunity. All right, last one, promise. The NCAA investigation <laughs> seems to be a major, uh, um, major issue in terms of hiring coaches and fan enthusiasm. Do you think UT had a choice about launching the NCAA investigation? In other words, if Pruitt had an eight and two season, would the university have aggressively launched an investigation or did they have no choice because of the whistleblower? I, th I think this, I think once it was sent over to the, the, the university side to the chancellor's office, um, it, it went to general counsel. And at that point it was, there was, it was, it was a full blown investigation. Uh, I think you you certainly run a risk that if you ignore that and it comes to the NCAA's attention that you were made aware of it and you didn't pursue it or didn't investigate it in any way, shape, or form, then you've got you've got major, 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 major NCAA issues. So I don't think ultimately they had a choice. Uh, once the general counsel's office got a, got their hands on it, it was going to be an investigation. Period. I, I I agree with that. I think if they were eight and two, and Jeremy hadn't gotten sideways with a few people. I think the digging would have been a few feet deep and not 400 feet deep. Yeah, that may be, that, that, that may be fair there too. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know that I would disagree with, with that notion either. So uh, regardless of what, when, where, the, pro, the fact is Tennessee is here where they are waiting on word from the NCAA. And obviously uh, in the meantime, got to get a coaching staff together. So we'll see if Josh, he Josh Heupel gets that done here in the coming hours and days as they try to put this defensive staff together. That's going to do it for this edition of the Mailbag Podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great Thursday, everybody.